to thank you first off um for i mean i was expecting you to reach out to me later on but um this is a great time to speak with you specifically because i want to hit the ground running for the new year in regards to the st louis john uh jane doe and i have and i think i've even i mentioned to you or via email that I have uh, MW is working with me. So, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's like a full circle on this mm -hmm. event. So I guess it was meant to happen for me. Um, but thank you so much for speaking with me, Bird. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have any questions for me? It, I have a couple of questions, I guess. No, no, no. Whatever you want to know. Okay. No, no problem, absolutely. No, I'm just, I'm excited that people are actually talking about it, you know what I mean? Because it just felt like for a while, I mean, you would get YouTube videos here and there, but they're just regurgitating the same information over and over. Yeah, so. yeah. And you're absolutely right where uh, when I reviewed your documentary and then I was, I looked previously before your documentary, uh, I also was going through other YouTube channels and it was a little sketchy and uh, the bits of pieces just didn't seem to fit how my mind works. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you because in your documentary, you had completely covered a plethora of information that no one else had done. So um, I thank you for that. And it's interesting how you just had it released this year. So when was it released this year exactly? So it was released for streaming on... Uh... We were told September 15th, but it actually got released on September 29th. Okay. Uh, which they tell me is unusual. It's usually like around within a couple of weeks of the date that they issue it. We, we had done a, uh, I had done an hour long uh, kind of YouTube one last year uh, with just a couple of interviews on it. I think it was four interviews total, but we got like 30,000 likes in a month and a half oh so God. everybody so we everybody we had some people saying hey what are we going to do next but then the majority of people were like no you stick with this like like if you got that far go further so that's what i decided to do so i was on this case probably close to two years probably about wow. 20 months total just only on the st louis j go so Wow, wow. That's how Meriwether got pulled in after the first one uh, in MW. So she, so I had reached out to a couple of podcasters in the beginning to see if they wanted to, to work together or whatever. And nobody really reached back out to me. So I had reached out to her and she watched the first one. And this is when I wanted to bring her in as a researcher because she watched my film a bunch of times and reached out to me asking questions. And then after like a week of that, she sent me like this 15 page paper that she had written out minute by minute and minute. And, and so I thought that was cool. That was something that could definitely add to us, you know, developing the timeline and everything. And speaking about uh, her, this is where we'll get to that point. But there is something about the psyche that, that me and her worked together on that, that really helped us get the answer we got. So. Right. Yeah, she is a hardcore researcher. And I. it's just so interesting how we kind of came across. I think I was going through her YouTube channel and I was like, oh, my gosh, she has such a, a vibrant soul and in, in, in her passion in her podcasting and research and I was like nobody's following her like what's going on there and I'm like here I just started my true crime podcast this April of this of 2022 so I'm fresh to the industry in regards to this genre but I've been doing podcasting for probably going on almost two years so um but it's so interesting how this world has kind of had a full circle in regards to how we all met up. And then um, I was doing the same thing, too, where I was reaching out to people 
who wanted to come onto my podcast, um, like in my intro, I like to speak with people who are advocates and people who are allies to the people of color community and stories that have not been heard at all. I didn't want to be like, you know, uh, a lot of other podcasters who just do the same story over and over again. And if you notice my little, um, how it's set up, none of these, none of these stories that I have on my podcast are even heard from anywhere else. Um, and I talk directly with the families of lost loved ones. And I get the in-depth stories about who these persons were before they became, you know, tragically at the end of their of their life. And I I wanted to take a piece of that because I wanted to connect all humanity that they're just not, they're not a, a someone in the article for a five second read. They had a life. 20 years before that, 40 years before that, five years before that, and no one knows about it unless you're a family member. So um, that being stated, uh, I was reaching out to different types of uh, organizations like, um, I believe it was one is called uh, Seed Sovereignty uh, in regards to the indigenous Mm -hmm. uh, data file that so, this woman created a database specifically to keep track of uh, indigenous people in, in the community of um, the United States. And I think she's trying to brought it into the in Can Canadian area. And you know, that, you know that comes to play in this story, right? Yeah. It, it's deeper. And honestly, M MW, I don't know if she told you, but she, in our investigation, she played a big role in that. So yeah. you should really go in depth with her about that, especially if you're looking at that. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, she's very humble in her in her things. She's and it's a... <laughs> humble with that because I just tell you a little bit about that. So I won't name the name of the detective because he didn't want to be on the film, but one of the major detectives in this case. Uh went down. So if you remember the lady in 2002, Sharon Nolte, uh, spent her own money. And so mm -hmm. she she told me it was, you know, a uh, Native American woman. So they went to Minnesota to a school where she, she said it was or whatever. And what they uncovered was that there had been a, a big majority of the kids from that school came up missing and murdered. So it just opened up something bigger than this case was and they had already known through dna that she was african-american and not native american so they didn't even want to get involved in that because of that reason because it was just too massive of the case and i, I just thought that was neat and, and meriwether so that that's something she has she actually uh found the lady we, we i told her i want to find this lady she found the lady and uh called her and the lady sent her like five or six like little three minute messages through text messaging and stuff so wow but it was, yeah it was going nowhere that lady basically was saying that she didn't know what Sharon Noble was talking about like <laughs> so but yeah I'm sorry to cut you off there no no like I said everything's full circle Every, we're all connected in by three degrees um yeah. so it's like you know, that being stated, so I was reaching out to a lot of the nonprofit organizations, um, people who are advocates, who are them themselves are people of color, indigenous, um, the LGBTQ community. And then I got a hold of Parabon Nano Labs and I just kind of threw an email out there. I'm like, hey, is it OK if I, you know, and they're like, no one asked us sure let's do that and I'm like oh my god okay <laughs> so uh I was completely nervous with them um but it was so exciting to see such powerful women taking charge of something that's just so detrimental um Absolutely. in the circumstances so I just want to share that with you as well oh no I, I could totally relate especially so what what happened there uh I don't. Do you want to go through the film first? Because I can talk about that later. Oh, um, it, whatever. I mean, I I edit all my podcasts and in videos, so oh, gotcha. we could do whatever you like to do. <laughs> gotcha. Well, and how how I got drawn to you is because of the film. People send me 
stuff or whatever. And then you posted on Facebook after you did the CC thing. So people told me, hey, she's listening to St. Louis Jane Doe. So I went and checked it out. And then that's when I heard CC mention the documentary. So that's all funny because I, I had reached out to CC and said, I know you're working on the case. Now, let's just say they don't tell you anything, but they do tell you stuff. So I knew before they officially told me where it was going, you know what I mean? I didn't know her part, but I know she was working. So she just kind of said, hmm, that's funny. That, that was pretty much her whole email. So then we get to uh, interview Detective McGlynn, and he's like, well, we're going to give him permission to talk to you, which blew my mind, by the way. And uh, So then I sent the email to, to Parabon, and I didn't hear anything back for like two or three weeks. So I sent an email to like three different people at Parabon, still didn't hear anything back. Boom, all of a sudden, I just hear, okay, you got the interview. Do you want to do it? So she hops on, and she's just like, before, before we even start, I just want to say kudos to you because I've had this case almost eight years and I haven't been able to tell a soul. And I'm like, well, I know you have your own TV show, so whatever you don't want to cover, I completely understand. She said, you know, I've been waiting to talk about this case for eight years. Let's go. <laughs> she was really cool. Really cool. That's awesome. That is so awesome. Um, yeah, I, I talked with her this. I think I released it probably about two or three weeks after I did the interview with her. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I was so eager to get it out. I was like <laughs> trying to push everything to the side. Like what's consider? Oh, I can wait till next week for that. I can do this. So yeah, it was just, it was just beautiful. And I was, I was honored to have them. They're like, yeah, let's do it. And I'm like, okay, wow. Um, what do we do? <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty exciting to know that, um, all of us are all connected just from this little girl. It's amazing. And um, just looking from that perspective, how even outsiders looking in, we're all connected to this girl, but there's other people who are connected by r relations to this girl. Right. And just my heart just breaks, like, especially watching a documentary saying that there was a few people that they reached out, you know, when CC identified in the end, where they reached out to a couple of people who were connected to her. This literally kind of ghosted her. And, and I was just like flabbergasted, like, dude, if that was like my cousin, my aunt, you know, something. And that kind of pushed me to do my DNA test. So that's kind of like how I rolled down into my little video of doing my birthday DNA um reveal thing that I'm processing. So I just received a ancestry done ancestry DNA just contacted me a few days ago saying that they are extracting it as we speak. So they're processing it. So it's about two or four weeks from now I'll get the results. And I just like feel like I just I need to be the a person who encourages others. You know, if I keep talking to talk, but I sure ain't work walking a walk. And I and right, I said, right, if I'm right. if I'm telling everybody else to do it, why am I not doing it? Exactly. So, it's, it's funny you released that because we're kind of actually doing the same thing. So with with one of the people that worked on the film, but we're doing doing the process, you know, filming him actually doing it. We're gonna film the paperwork because you know, even watching the film, even though they say the steps to do it, like like what do you do? You know, mm -hmm. people that need the, that visual. What yeah so so i am just like yeah i'm so excited um uh let's see what there's anything else um i do have a lot of questions like my mind was just racing when i saw i was i was in my car because i work night shift so i'm watching a documentary sitting in my car in between my shift and i'm like where is my pen where is my paper? I have so many questions. Like, so I had to go through it again. And I'm like, okay, is that the question I was going to ask? Oh, oh, there's another question I wanted to ask. So I have three pages of questions. <laughs> Whatever you need to know. Absolutely. Okay. First off, first off, um, I think to kind of start off this recording, I know we're, we're like rolling into our convo, but I, if, if I could have 
your name and what do you do and why are you uh speaking with me today is I guess to do a kind of an intro for this podcast so I can have that edited okay absolutely yeah my name's Heather Sosa I do go by bird everybody calls me bird it's been my nickname pretty much my whole life uh I'm from St. Louis uh I have a a uh, bachelor of science degree in criminology, which I've never used until doing this film. Uh, so the long story short is um, this happened when I was about nine, getting ready to turn 10 years old. And I, I kind of remember it, but what draws me back to it is I can remember being outside at that age and my mom telling me, uh, you need to, to come in because they're cutting little kids' heads off. Now, yeah, that's a weird sense of humor, but you got to remember at that time, Adam Walsh was decapitated. This had happened. Then there were the Atlanta child murders all happening around that time. And in St. Louis, the year prior, there had been two decapitations as well So of, of children. So I can understand. So it's something me and my mom talked about during the course of, of her life. She passed away in 2016. And, you know, grieving, I said, you know, it, I kind of want to do a documentary kind of because it's something me and my mom talked about. But, you know, you say stuff and that you don't really you mean it, but you don't mean it. You know, and I got COVID in uh, late February, early March of 2021. And at that time, they weren't letting people in the hospital or anything. So it's just you in a room with your thoughts. And I wasn't doing well. Uh, it was you know, it was a chance I couldn't make it. So I told myself one night, I'm just laying there, and I just said, you know what, if I make it out, I'm going to go ahead and make this film. So I did. I made it out. I sold my car a week later, and I used the money from the sale of that car to buy the equipment. You know, I had to research the equipment first because to get it streaming, you have to have certain cameras and things like that. And I just put into the research because I knew what everybody else knew. But I also knew a lot of it didn't make sense to me. You know? So early on, a friend of mine that I used to play basketball with named uh, Ty Dennis, he had left St. Louis and became a, a, a gang detective in Atlanta. So he's actually in the film as well. So when I was gathering the information, I'd get excited about this and that, you know. But he actually gave me one piece of advice to do this film, which I used in every aspect of the film, and that was, how does that add to the story, and what does it change? So if it wasn't in addition or changed the narrative, it didn't need to be in there. So great advice. Wow. Well, I love to hear the backstory of that. It was like, what made you push in this direction? What gave you that, that extra drive in focusing specifically on her case and oh my gosh like I uh just a side side note um when you sent me over your link I sent it over to a, a former police officer he's also now a security officer for one of the places I pick up I pick up specimens at different hospitals at night so I just got off of work a few hours ago um but he was like well that's my stomping ground I was born and raised in St. Louis I'm like okay, you know what, here, you listen, you watch this, he's like, did you ever hear this story? He was like, you know, I don't think I did, but he's like in his, I think he's probably in his 50s, so he has to at least know something. Um, but that he said he's got kinfolk there still and everything, and I'm like, wow, small world, huh? Um, I have a couple questions. They're probably not going to be in order. I just like went Whatever off the you, cuff. That yeah. <laughs> That's just me. Um, Okay, so I was going through your documentary, and I want to make sure that I say it correctly because I want to represent that in our in our the podcast interview. Um, so it is it is um, I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. Uh, our okay. precious hope. Okay, our, our revisited St. Louis's little mm -hmm. Jane Doe. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a that's a mouthful for me, but it's worth every second, every every word is precious, literally. Um, this movie, this documentary is, man, I was um, how you say it? I was air punching like, like the TV, like saying a lot of curse words. Um, I'm just beyond 
just aggravated why it took so long. And he said, on top of that, the 40 year anniversary, this is not the best anniversary to be celebrating, but an anniversary other than, you know, um, not being solved. And it, I just, I'm just flabbergasted by that. But one of the questions that I had, I could, um, I believe, yeah, so, so there was a couple of pictures, a lot of the photos that you had in there, and I love you were just so detailed, and you're absolutely, absolutely right. Um, all the information you had was, was just spawn on. It was a proper flow and understanding what, you know, if somebody was coming in and not knowing what, what this story was entailing, you made sure that you painted the picture to give her that, the, you know, at least the respect and knowing, you know, what had happened. Um, I would love to know who she was before. Um, and that's my goal. I want to get that like out there. It's not a, just about the after effect. It's mm -hmm. how can we find closure and find her peace mm -hmm. and have the proper family members come out and actually unsilence this whole 40 year old story of the St. Louis Jane Doe. So in uh, the beginning of your documentary, there was a couple of photos that you had identified of the crowd, you know, um, how it all kind of built up to the point where two gentlemen, you did identify who they were in the documentary after you first did your research. Ever. Yeah, first time ever. And after you were talking, you're like, I didn't even know their names were that. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, with your research, you found out who those two gentlemen who actually were younger than they were anticipated and um, how they. Yeah, that, that was crazy. Not to throw your question off, but like, in, in, and you know it from doing the research, it's always said two men. So you're envisioning like 30 year olds or 40 year olds. And right. You're teenagers. So. Right. Yeah. So that kind of threw me off there. So now I had to rewire my brain like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait a minute so um in the photos um i think you also were speaking with to with eric who is also a longtime resident of the area area um there was a photos of of a group of people who were just gathering around the area and i i was thinking to myself like i have that forensic scientist mentality because that was actually what i wanted to do when i graduated from high school i wanted to go into forensic science uh, here I am as a podcaster. How did that happen? So anyway, um, <laughs> those people who are crowding around as onlookers, um, do you know if anyone went through those photos, like a forensic document, document examiner? Because there's always that saying that the person always comes back to the, the scene of the crime. And yeah. that would be one question I'd like to no. Yeah, that was definitely a question I had asked. And, and basically, I was told, yeah, that's why those pictures were taken, was, was for that reason. Otherwise, they wouldn't even exist. So those are those are actually police photos, uh, the ones that are really detailed in color. So the, those are police photos. Wow. And they were able to at least weed through that and find out that None of these faces look suspicious or. Yeah, as far, um, as, they did... as far as they told me, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that there's even stuff they didn't tell me, you know what I mean? But as far as they told me, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, you know, my mind was just going in regards to that. And I know that there was a section in there where they were talking about that long walk. It's called the Ruth. Uh, yeah, yeah. So not today. It's called the the Greenway. Greenway. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the reason I put that in there is because it's literally like where the building stood. It's just down the alley, maybe sixty feet. So I felt it was important to include that because if this person was on foot, that's a possible route that people may not even knew existed other than that, because if I park two blocks over and then take that greenway over, if you're not looking at the greenway, you're not seeing me at three or four in the morning. You know what I mean? So that's why they wouldn't have had to park in front of the building is what I was getting at by showing that greenway. Yeah, I like the way that it goes you... to Ruth Porter Mall. 
Yeah, I'm glad that you're able to draw that in in as informational because that's where Maya, you decided to make me <laughs> increase my more questions that I had after that. I was like, okay, now I know why he was saying this. Um, let me make sure I, my questions are all over, so I'm just trying to make sure that I go it in. It doesn't matter, but I'm, um, I'm with you. We're here. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, the point is, like, on top of that, like, when they found her in not even the first room, but the second room, which was, like, 36 feet away from the entrance. Now, do you, Lynn, back to that greenway, you know, do you think they carried her in something to conceal her? Uh, because first off, you know, they probably pulled her out of something, out of a compartment or a bag or a tarp or something like that. I'm just, my mind just going because by the second room entrance, you know, they might have pulled her out of wherever they they had her and that was the reason for that splatter on that that second room entrance doorway you didn't and there wasn't no information in regards to a drippage or blood splatter on the way towards but only it started it began right at that second room entrance so my thought was like did they see if that could be a case yeah. Okay. Do you see her? Yeah. Yeah. So that's her right there. Wow. Yeah. So this this one, I'm going to answer your question. This picture I struggled with. I used portions of it. I struggled with what I wanted to put in there. But I felt like the first time you see it, if you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know where your eyes are going to go. So I didn't, I, out of respect, I didn't want to just throw something on there for like shock value. You know what I mean? So I, I wanted everything to have a purpose on why it was. But uh, I would say talking to the officers, I would say that the majority of them feel like she may have been rolled up in something because the way her body is, it's like it's just dropped. So, and that could be the, the way the blood is on the wall, which is the first time people's ever seen where the blood actually was. Because I've heard stories leading up to this where people said it's on the stairwell, well, there's no blood on the stairwell. So you're not carrying her sideways at that point. So then is it two people and you're carrying your top and bottom to get down the stairs? But yeah, I, I would just say that the cops feel like it's just dropped. So yeah. A high probability that she was in something so that there was no blood dripping. Right. Oh my God. It just makes me even more fierce just talking about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, Greenway, how long was Greenway? So, the Greenway is, is a few miles. Are you familiar with St. Louis at all? I've driven through it. I stopped to say hello uh, to yeah. my cousin, but that's it. Where are you from? Uh, I live in I lived in Wisconsin, but I I moved to Texas. I'm in Texas now for going on almost eight years now. So okay, okay. I went to uh, I went to school in Texas El Paso too. By the way, so, <laughs> no, it's on the other side of the state. But I uh, so it, it it stretches from uh, which is Martin Luther King, uh, but it's St. Charles Rock Road over to the zoo. So I want to say may, maybe 10 miles, like like in total, but to the cabinet courts, which is thrown to this a lot, you're talking maybe three, four blocks. Like it's not far at all. And, and it, it really is from where the building was, you would come out from the rear and make a left and then you would go down 60 feet maybe and it's right there and then it, it you can go either way and it's key because like now uh that that street is blocked off clemens is blocked off so like the alley is what's used for like traffic going both directions people use it regularly that's when i'm doing the interview with eric you'll see trucks and stuff going down the alley that's because that's how they bypass the street being blocked off so very interesting Wow, 10 miles. Holy crap. 
because I was thinking how close it was to a highway closest to the next nearest community uh, demographics area. Like, like you said, like you mentioned, like it could have been a place where someone could walk without being revealed mm -hmm. to actual um, street public area. Um, and park a couple of blocks away. Absolutely. And, and if, and again, I'm just saying hypotheticals here. I'm not saying this. Will right. Work, but if she's rolled up in a carpet and you're carrying a carpet down the greenway, even if you black, you're going to see a guy carrying a carpet. You know, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So. Yeah, that makes sense. That completely makes sense. I mean, and people take out their trash every, you know, at all times of the day. They could have thought that this person was just throwing something away in a trash bag and, you know, yeah. whatever. Hypothetically, I, I don't know for sure, but that's what I would think. So, so um, what got me like spewing all these other ideas is that when they found her, she had that red and white rope that twine and i was like see i'm not familiar with different types of knots but i was thinking like did they even look to see what the type of rope technique that they were using was this person might have had a scout knots bodhi knots sail knots military fly fish knots like were they thinking of like because uh, based on that there they might be a hypothetically a person who has a hobby in fish um fly fishing he probably you he or she or used this particular knot for that purpose um right. they were previous military they might have done boating knots um scout knots if they were previous um boy scouts um did they so go I through all that i would say yes uh especially talking to brian mcglynn so i took the knots i even posted pictures in Euro european groups and i, I talked to quite a few of, of knot tying groups and they all told me the same thing that there is no distinguishable knot it's just like lashings turning around so there is no actual knot in the photos that they can see so when i talked to the police about that they told me that their military expert told them the exact same information so it, it's been looked at by navy people and knot tying organizations through me and they had it looked at by military as well. So, and it tie it all ties together uh, because if you remember Dr. Joy Carter, she clearly says that there's skin slippage on the knee, skin slippage on, or on the chest, and there's none, there's no skin slippage around the wrist. So that means that if they weren't tied extremely tight, or else it, it, it would have caused damage, and it didn't. So I. I People may miss that in the film. And again, her interview was three hours. I had to cut it down to 30 minutes. But, but yeah, so it wasn't extremely tight. It was more of a control uh, tie. And I, I in, again, my opinion here, we really don't know what happened. I think they probably left it on because it was easier to move the body than just dangling arms or anything. Um. You know, here in Texas, you know, there's cattle ranches. We they do the lasso and they tie up the back ends of calves after they grab them. I'm thinking like, what other? It was probably just a very hypothetically. I'm just thinking a sloppy knot, just something to keep them, you know, contained in a sense. And with her in such panic and what was going through her mind, she probably did not know that uh, she wasn't. <laughs> tied up it as... started out like a game you know kind of like you said john wayne gacy used to do you know you don't know what they were you could have been doing cowboys and indians or something just to to get like that i mean mm. you just don't know but i will say this about the rope uh so over the course of years it's always been said that it was nylon rope well it was, it was uh, actually again through my research it's probably your thing they didn't even make nylon rope at that time and I, I had it very which I had the pictures verified uh, that that's what it would have been. The police did agree that, that that's probably what it was. They don't have it either. And this is information that the police gave me that they weren't sharing at the time. It's not in the film because again, it was something that probably would get misinterpreted. But that particular rule, now my numbers may be off by one or two here, but you'll get where they're going. So I believe they told me that that particular rope is spun at 100, 
53 threads to make that rope. This rope only had 152. So they kept that information hidden because they felt like if they could figure out the company that was spinning the rope at 152, then they know where the rope came from. And they just haven't been able to figure that out. Yeah, let me know if there's anything that I need to clip out because I don't want to be... No, you're good. Everything I'm going to share with you while we're... Okay. Video and you can share. Now, if there's other information I'll give you, I'll give you that. Okay. Because you're going to make my heart, my job harder if I had to, like, okay, off the record or no, off the no. record. I'm like, no, just, just don't We're say good. it at all. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I don't want to be the, um, uh, the person who spills the tea or makes it more difficult for the law enforcement to identify who. Yeah, no, no, there, there is quite a few things I can't share because mm -hmm. of that reason. But at the same time, you know, you any you can ask me anything and I'll tell you anything because it's not about me. It's really not. It's about her getting her name back. Right. And the more information that, that we can correct you. One thing I'm proud of is in putting this out, the uh, the Doe Network actually corrected the fact that she does not have spina bifida, has been misreported, and they also included about the green paint that was found in her neck. And they cite my film as that source. So I'm proud of that. I really am to be able to change her narrative because it could have been so many years that people were thinking it wasn't their loved one because she didn't have spina bifida, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking of that too. Like, I'm so glad I saw your documentary. I'm like, that completely just like, I know there was a lot of people who go in different, I know I'm like, whatever, but there's different other web sleuth and stuff like that who said like, this could be this person. And I'm like, no, it's rule those out, you know? Right. Okay. So, so yes. Um, gosh, my head is just spinning of this, like, uh, I'm but I'm, I'm so, gonna... no, spinning as in like, this got me all riled up with like, I'm just, so determined to get this out um as much as possible i'll throw something on your podcast no no one's ever asked me so you'll be the only even though all the but that wasn't a bunch but the few interviews i did no one's ever asked me this question so this would be definitely only for you so the way i was able to determine i had the picture i had a picture of where the body was located like i just showed you so i knew where it was the way i was able to get the measurements was because the building doesn't exist anymore. So I had to find a blueprint of the building. Well, there is no blueprint of the building. But I remember when I was in college, I helped the guy research a book. Uh, and he had me to look at something called the uh, uh, Sunborn Maps, which were the fire company that was for the city of St. Louis. They did maps of every building. So once I was able to find those maps, I was able to find the one for this particular building, which gave me the imprint of how the basement looked. So that's how I ended up with that actual blueprint of uh, the film was because of something I learned when I was 18 years old. <laughs> that is so interesting. You never thought that, like, how can you keep all that information, after, you know, from... And, you know, like, like really, I... I I didn't even remember I remembered that, you know what I mean? But like when I was like, how can I get this? It just popped in my head. You know, Randy McGuire showed me that. So. That is awesome. That is so yeah, what got me going was when they were explaining about the mold. I was like, and then when that I, I believe that um the black woman who is the um medical examiner uh dr joy carter yeah. yes 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 I, I do apologize um yes fabulous person fabulous person she looks like she's she's i she's a. Uh, I mean i want to pick her brain she's the kind of woman that i just want to be sitting there and just like listening to her because she has so much so much you know rich in in information and the intelligence is just so so much he couldn't put in one documentary um but for her to explain about you know the, the metal dust and the mold and you know the assault that was done unto um 
St. Louis Jane Doe or Precious Hope. And um, just a thought of all of that, like, you know, my mind was just racing like, yes, Molin. And I, you, I think it, there was a section where you did identify that it was um, Mole that was possibly from the instrument um, that, that was, did that cut meat. Yes, okay. that cuts meat. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like again, information that hasn't been out there. But I got I, here. Here's a great story about about the mold. Okay, mm -hmm. so after doing this for about a year, I'm, I, I've called the Missouri Botanical Garden a couple of times, and they're like, "Man, we don't we don't know what you're talking about." Okay, so I'm like, "Yeah, I gotta find this mold again." So I asked the detective. At this point, I had already did an interview with with Brian McGlynn. And so, it, it, you know, he was a great resource for me. And I'm like, well, I think I can get a copy of the mold report. And he's like, man, I haven't seen the mold report. So if there was one, it would it would be back there. So I, I get a hold of the medical examiner's office again. And I'm like, so I'm looking for a mold report. And I still have the emails for this. So the lady tells me, she said, uh, well, there is no mold report in the autopsy file you you have the autopsy that that's all we have that's in there so then i get a second email right back and said you know what there's a lady that's retiring they used to work here in 1983 let me ask her and see if she knows so a week later i get another email and she says so it wasn't in the file but she remembered where it was and went and gave it to them they let me get the copy and then put it back in the file so had she retired, that would have been lost forever. It's just like you said, it's like a circle. Everything just happens for a reason, you know what I mean? So it was crazy that that was. And then, of course, I sent the copy to the other St. Louis police. So, but oh, also, God. what's nuts about that report, which made sense after I talked to Dr. Mary Case, was that it, it says St. Louis University, it doesn't say the Missouri Botanical. But Mary Case told me that she worked for St. Louis University. She just worked at the St. Louis Moore. So their employer was the university, but they lent out to other. So that's why it made sense that they, they probably were working at the Botanical Garden, but they were working for St. Louis University. Yeah, that's interesting because there's always like a third party or you have a contract, you work alongside another organization. And yeah, that's how a lot of things get crossed and in regards to the reports, um, you know, this person works for so-and-so, but they actually worked alongside for a project for so-and-so. So I'm glad you actually were able to get my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, bird. Oh, Holy no. crap. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, what's the other thing here? So, yeah, I was just like, um, Dr. Carter, who identify like, they found the mold. Mm -hmm. It took them about four or five days to grow the mold. But she also mentioned that there was, um, if they looked even deeper about metal particles or medical metal, metal dust, and that wasn't looked upon, if I'm not mistaken. No, uh, that, that part of the interview is actually a lot longer than... Uh... I, I hated to cut it down, but she she basically went into like at that time they were actually developing with the the United States uh, military was developing that process of how to do it and it was being introduced to her because she she uh which is great about her is she was in the uh in the eighties she was in Miami that's where she was studying I mean she I mean she graduated school but that's where she was coming into her own so you know the cocaine wars are going on. There's a lot of dead bodies, decapitated bodies. So she's like the perfect person to look at this. And, and, and the crazy thing about that, again, full circle, is so when she actually, the autopsy is four pages. When we did our interview, she had a stack of papers like this. She had 10 times as many pages about those pages than the original doctor. So she, I mean, she, she really gave me a gift because she didn't charge me anything, uh, which was awesome. Like she really did it for the little girl because she had never heard of this case. 
And then I said, what do you want me to tell you about it? She said, no, I, I don't want anything to put out, you know, my thinking. So let me just review this and then we can talk about the case. So she went completely blind and just went off what she saw. Wow. A lot of this wouldn't, wouldn't have happened without the group of people who actually gave it down. And, there, and, and, and honestly, there, there, there are people that still do, like CC. I can tell you right now, in interviewing Brian McGlynn, like, he, he is into this case. Like, 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 every detail, every nook, every cranny, it, it, he is an amazing wealth of knowledge on this case really he he cares trust me mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can feel that through the film oh yeah absolutely yeah that's what i was trying to explain like this would not have happened if you know there's a whole lot of group of people who do give a damn and i'm so glad that her name uh, and hopefully her actual name is going to be presented to us um one of the other things i had like which kind of floored me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how I can identify or explain this this question or just kind of give you, when they were talking about the pubic hair, mm -hmm. which got me like WTF, like what? Like how can you not rule out particular people like the law enforcement medical examiner or during transport to finding a one single white pubic hair on her inner thigh uh, and you can't rule that out as to who is just walking around with just a random thing in her hand like oh just drop that but um you know i'm just i'm being cynical in 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 like what the heck you know um but what i was really thinking was like would this be something that the possible person of interest or the suspect could put there to kind of redirect law enforcement in a different direction. Okay, so I didn't put this in the film because, again, I need to talk about it. Okay, so that hair, even though it's in the story, wasn't found until the next day in the morgue. All right, now here's something I never knew, shocked me. And still, still every time I tell people, you gotta see their face. So you wanna watch your face after I tell you this, cause you're gonna be like, what? So did you know that they reuse body bags? Yes, but they're also supposed to sanitize them. Yeah, well, that wasn't happening, so. They believe that it's a huge chance that it, it possibly came from the body bag. So, okay. But Dr. Carter goes into that, like even in her interview, she says, "Like I had to cut it out again because of time and everything." She says, "It's a white pubic hair, and this is a black child." So, but it wasn't until I talked to the detective that they said, "Yeah, that was that was actually." later that that was found. It wasn't found on the scene. Because there's, you know, I I love the YouTubers for keeping her name alive, but there's a lot of people who just went and added their own narrative to the story, you know, and they'll say, oh, they noticed it on the crime scene and this, you know, you've seen how dark that basement was from the picture. That's not, it's not happening, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at your face. <laughs> I I had to put that negrita eye roll in. Like what? Another thing. The size of the sweater. Did this look like an adult size sweater, or was this a larger kid size sweater? Um, did it fit her, or did it kind of be too baggy? You know, what was the size? Even though the tag was taken off. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you familiar? I mean, because I think you even pulled out one that looked similar to it to show, I think is it Joseph, Joseph Burgoon? Or uh, was it another uh, gentleman? I showed McGlynn. I showed McGlynn. McGlynn, McGlynn. McGlynn. okay. McGlynn's seen it. I've showed uh, a couple of the other detectives as well. I showed Dan Fox. and, and uh, So according to the threat experts that I worked with, it was probably up. 
It was definitely a men's sweater. And it was probably a size medium. They don't believe it was a small because of the structure of the stitching underneath the armpit. Uh, as far as the, the way it fit the body, there's no actual pictures of the fit because the neck is stretched uh, in the original sweater. So it could have been stretched. It could have been pulled. And then the way when she's laying on it, it could be pulled up. So I, just based off on a picture, they said they couldn't tell like the snugness to her body, but but they they believe because of the stitching that that's what it was. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I, I, I tell you what, when when you start in, interviewing with the police, they always want to bet you like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But once you pull the sweater out and show them, it changes. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, and I was thinking as you were talking, like when you identify that it could have been stretched out, I wonder if they kind of like did this to keep to probably when she was alive mm -hmm. um because i know that the part where um dr carter i did identify that she went through a lot of suffering um right. based on the asphyxiation and the blood and so forth um i wonder if that had something to do with grabbing her and keeping her still while he he or she or whoever was inflicting this pain onto her um you know it's probably a reason why it was stretched out or maybe dragged her afterwards into it's just a whole lot of just oh my gosh my mind is just going all over the place but um thank you for that thank you for answering those um another question i guess is um before you ask your question i do want to say this too yes so the so i had told the police that i was going to get a forensic pathologist to tell me what the autopsy said it was actually the police's idea for me to include House of Beard the Rape was in the film because they said there's, it never was really known if she was or wasn't, but they wanted everyone to know how severe it was. Yeah. So that was a, going that deep into the rape was what the police wanted done. So, yeah. It, um, um, just a personal note, uh, I will clip this part out. I was sexually assaulted by my father. So I know I was at age nine. So I was literally around her age. So I understand all of that. Um, so when he explained it to me, this was like flashback. Um, the one and one and a half. No, it's I'm I'm healed. I'm in the journey. That's the reason why I'm doing I'm giving back. Um my pain becomes love and uh, determination for other people because I know I've been there. Um, but just the thought of them explaining in detail from the vaginal area to the, the peri is it per perineum area, which is the anal area um, being torn and then internal organ, internal vaginal wall is ruptured and hemorrhaging and just, the thought I'm 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 trying not to cry. Yeah, she was ripped apart. And there's actually a photo. Uh, so I'll say this to, to preface what the photo is. So a lot of people show the hands photo and say that the crime scene photo is not. That's a morgue photo. If you actually look past her leg, you'll see the white sheet from the morgue. So it's not actually a crime scene photo. Uh, but there is a portion of that that if you see the whole photo you can see some of her insides out. So that's probably why it's cropped the way it is. She was destroyed. I, and I'm not... It, it's sad, but I, again, I tried to... Dr. Not even just me, Dr. Carter as well. We tried to deliver the appropriate message in a respectful way, though. Yeah, uh, I'm an empath. I apologize. Um, you're good, you're good. Imagine, imagine this. You know, I I have daughters and everything. Imagine I had to go to bed with this every night for two years, thinking, "What am I missing?" 
So and 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 Mary has seen the entire has seen and taken notes on the entire three hour interview with Dr. Carter. So she'd be a good resource for you as well. Because there's other because there's other stuff what while, while you're you're doing that, I can tell you that Dr. Carter believes that this wasn't a murderer. She believes that this is a rapist. And this may be his first or second victim. And the only reason that this child was murdered, decapitated, was because he was he knew her. So, but she believed this is the crime of rape. She asked me to have the police go back in that time and look at rapists as opposed to murderers. She thinks that the investigation may have went the wrong direction, but based upon the severity of the crime, the way that there was aspirated blood and everything, that she believes it was a rapist. Yeah. <clears throat> what you shared with me right then and how it affected you. Yeah. You can relate to the to the crime, so she's probably right, honestly. Yeah. Um. Do you need a break? No, no. Let's keep going. <laughs> Let's keep going. Um. So also, you there was a when you were speaking to Eric. Uh, he identified there was a hospital couple blocks away from the area so my thought process was if this guy he or she or wh whoever the suspect is um if there was possibly they might have had some type of injury in the process of unaliving murdering this beautiful child maybe they might have had head you know hand injuries you know from the slicing um um, using a knife or whichever or maybe bite marks or some type of defensive wounds that you know precious hope was actually trying to defend herself mm -hmm. um maybe they have a record of a person coming in because i i think eric was saying yeah we got a couple you know there's a lot of uh gunshot wound victims that come in here and they take care of us um whenever there's and they're really good with the with patients like that but I wonder if they even had somebody who came across who is familiar because I think just the process of looking at the billing when you did the simulation of where the what the billing looked like from your simulation computer simulation as well as the photos is that that's a place where someone who wasn't familiar with the area would not known it was there and maybe this person was uh a local um maybe maybe moved out of, of the area because it was getting too suspicious for other people to know that this person was around so but they knew the area um maybe they went to this hospital and had some injuries tended to is there records of that did they even look into that by any chance i didn't, I didn't ask that question uh were they looking for bite marks or slats by his hand or anything uh, I did feel it was important because this li it literally is only two and a half blocks away uh, from where this is at. I felt it was important to show that because I had thought in the beginning, what 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 if the child was they were trying to get her help and she died along the way, so they were trying to hide it or something. So I wanted to show if she was an injured child originally that there was help in the area, but they chose not to to go and and, and you know get her help. So. But no, I did. Your, your question is a great question. It's, it's not one that I thought to ask. Um, and what doctor? And I just keep focus on Dr. Carr. She is just full of knowledge. Oh, um, yeah. she's an amazing, just amazing to listen to. Um, first ever African American chief medical examiner in the country. That's what I'm saying, girl. <laughs> Get it? You know. Um. But uh, she identified like mostly the the damage was done towards her face, and which, um, which which has never been known even by the police. Yeah. So they actually asked me to see her her interview because I remember the question the night we premiered it for a couple of the officers. They're like, "Why her?" And I'm like, "Well, she's a, a forensic pathologist." And they were like, "No, that's not what I'm asking." 
we've had eight other people look at this and she's the only one to point that out to us. And it made perfect sense to them and they knew the information was there, but no one else had tied it together. Yes, because she was she was spot on. You have to have someone who is familiar with the lividity in the um, the livor that she was identifying based on people of color, their skin and their um, blemishes or their lividity in their rigor mortis or whatever stages of after death is completely different than someone who has lighter skin. You, there's the patterns are the same, but you have to literally have that particular understanding on what the skin does in that that step of the process of of death and dying and um inflict the pain so she was on it she was on it um and i think what's the other question was the part where she was identifying that they did not find any food in her stomach Mm -hmm. Did they even look to see if in her small or large intestines to see if she is eaten at all? How long is the process of not having no food in their system? How long does that take for a child between the ages of 8 to 11 years? I, I'm not going to do an actual experiment here. I would love to be telling my kids, you better learn how to cook. But I know that's only going to last for about 30 minutes and they'll find something to eat. But I'm thinking like for her... How long does she have to go without no food in her system to not right. have anything shown in the autopsy as any food or any evidence of being fed? Absolutely. Uh, so, as it's always been stated, it does state it uh, in the autopsy as well, which you have a copy of, so you'll be able to uh, go ahead and read that for yourself. But it, it, it has always been stated that she wasn't malnourished, so she was eating. So it's probably during the course of, you know, we always hear four hours or whatever. So I would, I, again, this is my estimation. I, she probably hadn't eaten at least in eight hours because there, were, there was nothing in the stomach. I, I'm i not a doctor. It could be listed, could, Dr. Carter, not that I can remember, said anything about the intestines, but uh, if it's in there, I, I mean, you, you have it, which is great because you'll be able to read it and see that it never says she had spina bifida. <laughs> yeah, good. We can we can debunk that. That's for sure. Um, and then I think I have probably about four more questions. I hope I can squeeze it in. Um, the gym bag, Lord, mm -hmm. was found after discovery and removal of um, St. Louis Jane Doe. Right. Is that like a drug drop off or something? You know, like I they were completely saying specifically in that area there was a lot of drug drugs and prostitution. Right. So I can say that in in asking that question, uh, it's not even a, a question I asked Bergoon in the beginning. He just he was going into how thorough they did everything, and that later they get that call that there's a gym bag in there, and then when I asked McLean about it, he was like. Yeah, and there's a police report on it. So I would assume there's something else that goes with it for them to make a police report on it. But yes, at this time, it was a very high drug area. So it wasn't in 83 from Eric and other people that lived in the community that we talked to. It, it wasn't a crack area yet. It was heroin and something that they called a, a teas and blues. So it was, it was drugs, heavy drugs, but different drugs than crack. Because yeah, a lot of times you hear, or you'll see online, oh, it was the crack era. It, it wasn't in St. Louis at that moment yet. Yeah, I don't know. I don't um, know that area. I mean, in regards to drug of choice. Uh, <laughs> right, right. But right. Uh, I think 83, I was six years old. So, um, I yeah. Nine, so. <laughs> yeah, so it's like my drug of choice was probably chocolate. There you right, go. Right, right. <laughs> I had a six years old. Um, and I have two more, well, two and a half more questions. Um, core, I believe that was something that I, this is probably something I'm not really going to hit on, but can you tell me more about what this core, it was an acronym. It was. Um, yeah, the, the, the 
Congress. Uh, I don't. I honestly can't remember. It. I, honestly, they came in later. Uh, they were trying to be a part of it. Uh, they were organizing a couple of uh, meetings. I, I, I want to say that they organized a meeting at in front of the vacant buildings like a year later, demanding they be torn down uh, as well. So that was their main focus. And the guy went to court because of that. You know, that they're kind of the name that's being associated in the press with, with this. So the guy was just trying to get money or, or whatever. Uh, again, one representative, it, it said that there was a representative of Congress at the first funeral. I think they meant in that ar article that they were talking about core, not actually Congress, but it isn't stated core. It says Congress, but I do believe, because it's a lady, you can see her in one of the pictures, which talking about the pictures, no one had ever contacted it today before. He even gave them the, the pictures for them to locate the body. And they didn't even invite him out there to look for the body. And he's never talked to anybody before. So I thought it was important to have somebody at the first funeral to give a perspective on that. So, Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And then um, just to see the process that they had to do, like first was it was a five minute uh, ceremony. And then the search for her, after the funeral, you know, they went through, I'm, I'm not sure, like bad business or bankruptcy or the, the person committed suicide. The owner of the comp of the funeral um, cemetery um, business. And let me throw this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw something for you to think yeah, about. It. Yeah. Okay, so, so imagine this. So she was buried December 2nd of 1983. All right. Yeah. Her, head, her, her, her headstone was was made but they didn't let it they didn't let them put it on so the students wrote letters they get permission so they finally put it on in may right five months away okay so and again i'm, I'm not saying this is fact i'm just throwing something at you to think about okay so i believe that they knew where she was but they couldn't they couldn't put the headstone where she was because they had already buried somebody on top of you yeah. gotta remember there's a body on top. And we know that because they had to quit burying bodies in 1983. The reason Virginia Younger becomes the owner is because the actual owner at that time had to transfer to somebody else's name because he was being sued. So they didn't mm -hmm. start burying anybody again until 1986. So for there to have been a body on top of her, you can't put a headstone there because the other person's family is going to be like, uh, that's not her grave. You know what I mean? So I think mm. in the vicinity, but not necessarily on the grid. And again, that's just the theory I have. Oh but no, I I completely agree. And the person was built was uh buried three feet. Like mm -hmm. who does that? Unless yeah. you are trying to be sus, knowing that there's something three feet underneath that, you know, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, we're just we're just throwing it out there, no. <laughs> um. And I guess this is kind of like a, a, a kind of a wrapped up question, a wrapping up of the of the end of our conversation. Um, my side note here: Can I use snippets of photos from the documentary as part of my podcast? Whatever you need. Because I was thinking about using her pink dress as um, a poster for the episode. Yeah, that's cool. That's just a honestly, that's a that's just a stock photo. Okay. That I paid, that I, that I paid you know licensing for to you. So. You oh. Know. Oh, yeah. it wasn't her her actual pink dress. No, no, that's not her actual dress. Oh. That is the style, but that is that is her actual casket though with the, the angels on it. Right. So, and but, it was. Uh... That was a pretty long service, and I was thinking, I was look, and I was looking at her like, I don't see no one with the little little right. melanin in their skin. <laughs> but I, you know, that was just me. That was just my little side note. But let me um, ask you this: Prior to this film, have you did you even know there was a video of her funeral? Out there? I didn't. No. Nope. And that's actually her obituary. So that's really her obituary. That's the actual. That's not the actual bagpipe song 
but that is the version play that they used that day by the bagpipes. And that is uh, Peter Gunis's, I had him reread it for the film. That is what he read that day at the gravesite. So. Wow. I put, a, wow. I put some work into it. I you put a lot of love and heart into this documentary. Oh my gosh. And I guess to, as, as a, cause I think we pretty much just answered all these, this last question, but is there any more information that you've received outside of this um, after completing your documentary that you'd like me to share to the listeners? Well, here's something. So uh, the night I debuted, I debuted it for Brian McGlynn, we did it at the movie theater, MX Theater downtown. That was for him and any policeman that wanted to come after the movie was over. He came up to me. He said, I wanted to let you know that uh, because this was coming out, I decided to call the Smithsonian to see if there was any other information that they might have had that we didn't have anymore. And they told me that they still had a six inch section of her bone and would I like it back? And I told, and he told them yes. So the police now have six inches of her bone. So they don't have to disturb her, uh, her grave again. But at the same time, they can still do future testing. So that's that's a beautiful thing. That is. Oh my gosh. And I'm proud of that too, because he may not have called. He may or may not have called, but because of the film, it helped get that call done sooner. I guess I could say. So. Yeah. My gosh. A hundred percent, a hundred times fold kudos to you, the, the the group, the rest of the law enforcement, the ones that actually came back, the ones who have been dedicated since the beginning. Parabon. 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 And I, I tell you what, pe people don't know this. I mean, really, this is probably one of the first times I'm speaking on it, but uh, the, the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children I actually had a conversation with a couple of ladies that were there and they uh they helped guide me. They, they told me, you know, you you you're getting a great relationship on this film. Don't don't make the police look bad. And honestly, it wasn't about making them look bad. I was gonna I did my film, I have no speculation. Everything in my film is verified by a doctor or a police officer. So I wanted nothing but the truth that's in the film. And I genuinely believe for what they had to work with, they did what they could. You, you know what I mean? Could could they did something different? Yeah, but we're looking at, at eyes from 2022. Our eyes would have been different in 1983. You, you know what I mean? So, I mean, well, for sure. I mean, coming from, I've come from neighborhoods like that. Um, I ra I was raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Right, right, right. The river, the river. <laughs> What? No, it was a river east. So river west was all the little pretzies next to the Marquette University. We were on the other side of the river. There was, yeah, heroin, crack, prostitutions, gangs, people. I watched a, a man beat his wife or girlfriend in the middle of the street, bloodied. And, you know, it's I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And I was a victim uh, from a couple of those things as well. Um, so I... I've seen it, and it's the point of having the cops. They had at least a, from that time of childhood, you it leaves a bad taste in your mouth in thinking that you could respect and and call on, you know, someone who is supposed to serve and protect the community. When, in our eyes, in our view, during a time of need. You know, they were the persons who were either part of it or delayed in their response or automatically be made us consider the guilty before we were identified as innocent based on our status, based on where we lived. And it was not my fault. You know, yeah. so, yeah, I, I give props where props is due. And I think from the bottom of my heart, all the people that the law enforcement, the medical examiners, all the interviewees that you have worked with, you yourself, like Parabon, kudos, kudos, props. I give full uh, respect to people who were in so much passion from the get go. You know, um, Mr. Burgoon and 
the rest of the I I do have their names. I will call them out as I edit. But what I uh, wanted to say was something that was important to me in this film, as I did the research before, was that uh, I had heard all these names didn't know who the people were so i thought it was very important to put a face with every name so that's why you'll find a picture for everybody and honestly the picture of virginia, virginia younger was given to us by a, a researcher at washu who had written a paper about washington park cemetery so mm. uh, that was great to get that picture from them uh a couple of the pictures mary found so I would say, hey, Mary, I've been looking for this picture for three months. I'd have it in like two days. Like, I think this is it. So, so yeah, she was really hard on that. I thought that was important. And you always talk, you, you, you've you been talking about the full circle thing. So I wanted to explain kind of how I, I had a guided hand help me with this. So from the moment I decided to do it, first thing I wanted to do was uh, had to get Bergoon. He was still alive. I had to get Bergoon. But I don't know anything like that but my cousin uh, a cop so i said i'm trying to find this old officer named Bragoon. i know he's alive but i don't know where he's like Bragoon, i know Bragoon. she said let me call you right back so he called back he said wasn't him i'm like oh okay he said but it was his son so he's gonna give you a call so he calls me up we arranged the interview so then i'm like okay i want to see washington park what it looked like we go to the camp find the grave there's a guy cutting the uh, grass. So I asked uh, Lee and my daughter to go talk to the guy. And they come back and they say, uh, he's going to show us where it's at. But not only that, he was one of the volunteers that helped to dig her up. <laughs> I'm like, what? And, and he's going to give us an interview. So wow. was Yeah, I was looking for Abby Stylander, who was the research assistant, or excuse me, the researcher that found the body when it was lost. I was looking for her for almost two years and literally the the day that i decided that at the end of this week i'm going to stop recording we're going to start the editing process she sent me an email said i'll do it so she was the last interview we got and she gave me 12 minutes and every second of her interview was in the film like, like, she just had an infectious personality and personally i believe she's a hero because who who looks at a picture and says i can find you, you, you know what I mean? Like, that's incredible. But then, like, the whole CC thing, I wasn't expecting that. And uh, it just all fell in line, like, everything. So let me tell you about Eric. So me and Eric have known each other since 1993. And this has affected us both in different ways. And even though we've seen each other throughout the years, we have never talked about this case to each other. So I posted on Facebook, hey, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm going to do a film about this case. So he inboxes me and he's like, uh, you mean the, the little girl that was killed on the west side? And I'm like, yeah. He said, dude, I was there that day. I'm like, what? So what, what, what's cool about that, well, not cool, but you understand what I mean. So Eric told me, uh, not just me, if you go on my uh, YouTube page, you'll see him talking. And uh, he says that, uh, and he's told us this before on film too, that he, the first day he ever heard of the word nylon was on the scene that day. So until he was like older, much more mature, every time he heard the word nylon, he associated with the little girl being tied up. That was his association for that. So that was crazy. And Dr. Carter, that was crazy. So I'm sitting at home watching YouTube. And I'm like, man, I got to find a a uh, medical examiner that speaks in words I understand because I had it uh, quite a few months at this point. But I, what am I looking at? I'm not a doctor, so I'm watching YouTube and she pops on on a, on a YouTube thing. I'm like, I'm gonna reach out to her, so I reach out to her. And what's great about her was her first email told me, "Yes, I'll do it. Uh, I don't charge anything," which was great. I didn't have money to pay her anyway. And then she said, but, uh, you know, uh, I got some things I got to take care of first. So I had to wait just a month, which wasn't that long for an interview. I'm, I'm sure you know that. So it just was incredible that, that she came with as much information as she did. Everybody just fell in line, fell in line. Then I wanted to say, you know, we haven't talked about the psychic. 
Yeah, I was trying. I was I like I I didn't know how much time you had, but I I kind of had more questions in regards to that. I just so like I said, I, I'm an empath, but I also have a clairvoyant. I'm clairvoyant, so I was like, I don't want to touch that. I know everybody to each their own, but if you had tidbits on it, feel free to share. I just didn't have any questions in regards to it. So well, well I I won't say about the psyche, but. I but I am proud of that we're clearing up the fact that she didn't mail it back because she did. So. Yeah, she, she, so there was a return receipt or a proof of delivery, correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I figured there was something like that. So yeah. someone's holding out on something in the, in some department, something fell through the cracks. I'm trying to, I'm wondering yeah. if this is like an, in, like, I, I, okay, off the record. I don't want to tell anybody this. Is this an inside job? I'm just going to throw it out there and whoever catches it. That comes if it up a lot. Yeah. That, I mean, people talking about that comes up a lot. I, yeah. I'll say this when in talking to the cops, like when he told me, yeah, I got the receipt, like in my head, I'm thinking, you know you can't tell me that. So even when we're getting done, I'm like, can I use this? And honestly, you saw him at the event. He just was like, yeah, it's time. It, it's time people know. And, you know, he also, they also said, you know, we never said she didn't return it. Other people did. We just didn't correct it. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, because I'm like, when you are giving that type of evidence and I think there was even a mention in there, unless unless it was just my mind saying it, but wouldn't you give at least a, just a piece of material? They don't need to have the all of the material, but the milling the whole only evidence that you have <laughs> and then say that it's lost. Like my mind was on a tangent uh, in regards to that. So, yeah. I won't say, yeah, I... Not against you or anything. I'm not going to say whether I feel one way or another about, you know, people being clairvoyant or whatever. But I will say in the research, three separate psychics all said the head was in water. So I don't know how they would have had the other person's readings or whatever, mm -hmm. but three. And one was recent. So. Yeah, the thought when you said it was on a boat to Mexico, I was just like... That's a little far fetched, but I can't. Not I can't. Really. It, it, not really. No, 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 no. no. A... If I believed in it, let me just say this. I'm not saying I do, because I, honestly, I don't. But I wouldn't say it's far fetched because the Mississippi River goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it is true. And that is lot, true. There's a lot of barges that come through here. So it's, if I you think... believe in it, it's not far fetched.